May the words that I now speak and the thoughts and feelings that we may share or experience be always acceptable in your sight and hearing, O Heavenly Father. I'm asked this morning to talk to you about what's described as Christ's first miracle, that's the wedding at Cana. And some theologians call it the epiphany of Jesus. I wonder what your thoughts might have been when you read these lessons or, or heard them this morning in terms of what the link is between them. It's our convention, as you know, in, in the non-conformist tradition among Protestant churches, it is our convention that the preacher should find a link between all three of the lessons that are set for a particular day. It's an assumption that they are somehow intertwined. When I first looked at these three, I couldn't quite see the link, particularly between the Old Testament and the Gospel and the Epistle. When I sat down to make my notes, I was struggling to find what that link could be, but I think I found it and I'll share it with you for a few minutes. If you look first at the Old Testament reading from Isaiah, Isaiah was addressing the people of Israel just after they'd been released from yet another long period of exile. You'll remember, won't you, reading through the Old Testament that the Jewish nation was frequently being invaded, carted off into slavery, released again, and this was one of those periods. And Isaiah says they are now physically free, but their future is far from certain. And Isaiah says to them, what sort of future do you think God has got in store for Jerusalem now that the exile is over and we are free? He said, we are still, we're still in the doldrums, we're still down in the dumps because, yes, we're free, but as you heard the lesson read, the land is desolate, it's barren, it's not producing food, and the city of Jerusalem was partially in ruin. And into this uncertainty, Isaiah says, we have a yearning. We have a yearning for God's spirit, a yearning for his hope, a yearning for a signal that he's with us. Isaiah suggests that what they're yearning for is a new kind of relationship with Almighty God. And to encourage them, he says in verse 1, that God will not be silent until your hope is fulfilled. Isaiah looks to a future in which Jerusalem's, Jerusalem, sorry, Jerusalem's deliverance and splendor is seen throughout the land again. God and his people enter, Isaiah says, into a new relationship. Up until now, Isaiah says, we called our land names like the deserted wife and the forsaken. But now, Isaiah says, we'll give it new names. It'll be called, God is pleased with her, happily married. Isaiah says that God will commit himself to Israel just like a young man commits himself to his new bride. Ah, so there we have it. There's the link then, I guess, between Isaiah and the gospel. Isaiah described the relationship that Israel would have with Almighty God as a marriage. Jesus attends a marriage in Canaan, the so-called the first miracle of Christ, the wedding between a young man and his new bride. And as is so often the case with the miracles of Jesus, it seems very simple. The story doesn't seem that much in it, it's just the transformation of water into wine, which yes was a miracle, but that's all it seems to be, and there's only a few verses in John's Gospel about it, but I want to suggest to you this morning that if we look deeper into it, there's much more significance here than we can find. First, let's think about the physical setting of this miracle, which John tells us is the first time that Jesus chose to show 
his extraordinary and divine power. It's a very public gathering. It's a great social and community occasion. It must have been a pretty big affair. Perhaps in today's social terms, the wedding of the year that would have gone into Vogue or Vanity Fair if they had such publications. This must have been the biggest thing in the neighborhood for some time. And why do I say that? I say it because Jesus changed 600 liters of water into wine. 600 liters, folks. Now, for those of you who, like me, are not, are not teetotalers, that's 750 bottles. By Jove, that was some party. They were pretty thirsty guests. So why is the setting important? Well, I say it's important because it was a pretty big audience in front of which to do your first attempt at a miracle. And if it had gone wrong, what a social disaster that would have been. Not just for Jesus himself, but for all the guests. They'd been promised wine and it had run out. That's not the only interesting thing about this first miracle. The next thing to notice, I suggest, is this. It's Jesus' mother who pushes him forward. As Roy said, Jesus was reluctant to do it. And he said to her, don't tell me what to do, woman. Not sure that it's right to say that in today's society, but that's apparently what he called her. He was obviously annoyed. Don't push me forward, woman. He says, my time has not yet come. It's clear, I think, from John's Gospel, Jesus was reluctant to show his power at this particular point in his ministry. But Mary's a pushy mother. Well, she would be, wouldn't she? She knew he was different. Look, his birth was strange. They flee into exile to Egypt. They have to come back. So she knew he was different. So she pushed it. Go on, go on, you can do it. You can do it. You can do it. So Jesus had little choice. And, and she says to the servant, just do what he tells you. The second thing of interest is the water that Jesus used to transform into wine. The jars in which the water was stored would have been the jars into which the family had put consecrated, purified water. In a Jewish home, these were the jars that the Jewish people would have used to wash their hands, to wash their face, to wash their feet. Purified before eating, purified before drinking, purified before spiritual things. So Christ is taking purified wa water and turns it into wine. Some theologians suggest that that was deliberate. He didn't say to the servants, go and get some wine from the kitchen. He used the wine that was in the jars, purified. Some theologians suggest he was sending a signal to that large gathering of people of his own purity and what would be his own transformation from human into divine. Third thing to notice is the almost semi-secret way in which the miracle is carried out. He obviously says something to Mary. She pushes him, and he obviously says something to her because it's she that says to the servant, just do what he tells you. I presume he whispered something. There's no fanfare. He doesn't stand up and say, hey, watch this, folks. This is going to be good. He doesn't stand up and say, oh, gosh, what a social disaster. Big wedding. Host has run out of wine. What a terrible host. But never mind. I'll sort it out. Hey, watch this. This is going to be good. No, he doesn't do that. He just presumably says something to the servant, and they do it. So what was that all about? Jesus clearly was not interested in performing a parlor magic trick. He wasn't concerned that being very clever in front of that large gathered crowd. 
Perhaps he was more concerned with how they would react when they saw the transformation of the water into wine. I think he wanted them to see that with faith in the power of God, with belief in the power and presence of Almighty God, I think Jesus wanted to see that things, places, social situations can be changed. I think the message for us to take away is this. No matter how great our social disasters might seem to be, no matter how deep our failings, no matter how problems that we may have in our own lives or even amongst our church community, no matter how much we feel inadequate or powerless or feeble, we can be transformed by the power of grace of God. I think the final thing about this miracle is this. It was indeed for the host a very real human tragedy. He is hosting he or she, presumably it would have been a he in that, that society. He's hosting the wedding of the year and it's gone wrong. They were either much thirstier than he had anticipated or there were more came than he had anticipated. They've run out of wine social disaster egg on his face a typical human situation and into that human situation jesus steps achieving a real physical transformation john's gospel if you look at it and look at the miracles that john reports in his gospel they are often concerned with people who are in difficult human situation. And frequently Jesus steps in to their human situation and sets it right. The transformation of the water into wine was a parable, of course, as well as a miracle for those who had the eyes to see and the minds to understand. Because it pointed ahead the transformation of human life into the new life offered by Christ by his dying and raising again. Then I looked at the epistle, and this is where I struggled. It's a well-known passage. You've heard it, I'm sure, many, many times before, and it stands on its own. But why did those who put the church diary together, why did they decide to include that in this morning with the other two readers. It seems to be about something completely different. I don't, think it, I don't think it is. Paul, throughout his ministry, amongst all of his teaching and his preaching, if he had one overriding desire, I think that he was always concerned about the nature of the new life which comes from the new situation that Christ had brought with him. And as we heard in that passage, Paul was quite sure that this is new life in a community. Yes, Paul says it's important that each one of us makes our own spiritual journey. It's important that we all grow and develop our understanding of our relationship between ourselves and Jesus Christ and through him to Almighty God. But Paul makes it clear, I think, that it's also about community. Paul says we are not on this spiritual journey on our own. We share it with our fellow Christians. And of course, that first miracle took place in a community. Jesus was looking and addressing the needs of a community. Paul was also clearly aware in that letter that as much as we struggle to work and live together and share together as a community, that we will have problems. Paul is aware that as humans, we can be arrogant, we can be proud. We can, if we're not careful, disrupt and damage our community of faith. 
and hence his message to the new church of Corinth. We're told that Paul wrote the letter because although the church of Corinth was new, it was already having division. And in particular, we're told Paul was concerned because they were discussing amongst themselves who was the most important, who was the most important leader, who was the most important preacher. This is a new church. So division in the church and differences of view, brothers and sisters, is, is not new. So Paul writes to the church at Corinth and says, it isn't like that. Yes, he says, you've all got gifts. You've all got abilities. You've all got things to offer, but nothing is more important than the other. And critically, no one is more important than another. Paul's message here is one faith, one Holy Spirit, one community. As a circuit, we are in a difficult situation. We don't have a superintendent, so I rephrase that. We don't have a superintendent working with us at the moment. And uh, I'm not sure if I've told you through your circuit stewards, but Mark has been signed off uh, until late February. Uh, Nigel Cowgill, who, as you know, is acting as our superintendent, and I have been having conversations about what will happen after February. So we are struggling with the circuit. We're struggling with those problems and struggling with differences of views. Paul says to us, all of you have an opinion, all of you have a view and you're entitled to that and it is right that you express it. But at the end of the day, Paul says, we are one community, one church, one circuit within the Methodist family. No one's work, mine, church stewards, ministers are more important than anyone else. Paul says to us that the Holy Spirit is at work in everyone, even when we don't recognize it's there. Paul's words are words, I suggest, which the church, the whole Christian church, needs to constantly take to heart. For it's only with the greatest difficulty that we can overcome self-importance and self-centeredness. May the transformed life created by Jesus Christ at the wedding of Cana continue to give us all the courage, the strength, and the grace to overcome whatever life throws at us and enable us to continue to build this church and this circuit to the glory of Almighty God.